One of the questions I get asked the most by my students is how can I improve my vocabulary? I feel like I'm using the same words all the time. I want more advanced vocabulary. I want to improve the way I talk and the way I come across when I speak to others. And honestly, I wish there was a magic wand that I could wave and you all had better vocabulary. But like anything, learning something new, it just takes practice. That's all it is, is practice. I will do my best to help you as much as possible. But honestly, the best way to improve your vocabulary is keep listening to English videos such as this one. Keep reading articles about things you are interested in. And that is exactly what I want to do with you today. I found a fantastic article on the National Geographic website. Now, I really like the National Geographic's website because they are challenging articles. And there are so many interesting topics there that you are bound to find something that you enjoy, you like. Whether it's technology, culture, art, climate change, the environment, newly discovered species, whatever it is you are interested in, you will find an article about it on the National Geographic and they are beautifully written articles. They use such fantastic vocabulary. Now, I must say this is not a sponsored video. You can use whatever articles you want. But in today's video, I want to go through an article that I came across that was about the way we describe food, the advanced vocabulary that we see when we're walking through a supermarket and it says meat and there's all these other words describing the type of meat. Or you want to buy eggs and there's all these different words on the boxes of eggs and you're not sure what the difference is. That is what I want to talk about today. I will, of course, leave the article somewhere in the comments. There will be words there that you could look up, add to your vocabulary if they're relevant. Now, I find this topic very interesting because I love food. I love eating food. I love knowing exactly where my food comes from. Even though I cannot cook myself, I'm not a very good cook, I do enjoy eating and tasting new things, new dishes. And one of my dreams in the future is to be able to grow a lot of my own food, vegetables, fruit. So for me, this is a very interesting topic. If it's not that interesting for you, that's okay. You can either go and check out some of the other videos on my channel or Alternatively, use it as a listening tool. Just listen to the video and if you can understand 70, 80, 90 percent of what I'm saying, you know your English is improving and hopefully it will help you understand when you are next in the supermarket trying to buy yourself some groceries for the week. Ah, that's a good point. Groceries. Now, typically, British people would call this food shopping, food shopping. We don't say we're going grocery shopping or we're going to get groceries. We say we're going food shopping or we're going for a food shop. But American English, they're much more likely to say groceries. I need to buy groceries. I'm going grocery shopping. But they both mean exactly the same things. It's food. It's things to give you energy throughout the week, to keep you alive throughout the week. Now, our first phrase is dietary requirements. Now, if you've ever been to a restaurant in your entire life and it's an English menu, you will often see at the bottom of the menu or at the top, somewhere on the menu, it will say, if you have dietary requirements, please let us know or please make us aware of any dietary requirements. Now, dietary requirements means the same as allergies. It's just something you are allergic to, something you cannot eat because it gives you a bad reaction. Your body cannot handle it. But the reason we say dietary requirements instead of, is there anything you're allergic to, is because for some people, their dietary requirements are a choice rather than something that is a medically issued thing. 
So for example, a lot of people are allergic to prawns, meaning if they eat them, they will have a serious allergic reaction. Their body will react to the prawns and some people have it so badly that they could end up in hospital. However, if I actively choose not to eat seafood, that is still a dietary requirement, but it's not because I will go to hospital if I eat seafood, it's because I don't want to eat seafood. This is why we call it a requirement rather than an allergy, because it is something you are requesting. I would like to ask no seafood in my dish, in my meal. And I'm going to go into some of those requirements now that you might have seen. So the first is gluten free. Gluten free. This wasn't so common 10 years ago, but it's becoming more and more common now. Gluten free is someone that cannot process, their body cannot process wheat or any foods containing wheat. So for example, bread, pasta, cereal, any sort of dough, cakes, this is either because they actively cannot eat it, their body cannot process wheat, cannot process these, these enzymes, these proteins, they cannot break them down. Or it's because the person has chosen they do not want to eat gluten. So when you're in the supermarket and you see the gluten-free section, which is very popular nowadays, what this means is that this is a section where everything in this section uses something that does not contain gluten. So instead of wheat flour, they might use rice or corn flour. The next one is vegan. Vegan. Now I'm sure you have heard these next two phrases a lot. Vegan and vegetarian. A lot of students ask me the difference. I think I covered this in another video, but I cannot remember now what, which one the video was. So a vegetarian, as the name suggests, does not eat meat. They eat vegetables. I mean, of course, there's a lot more to eat than just vegetables, but they don't eat meat. This is a choice that they have made. So again, it's not an allergy. It's a choice. Now, of course, you can be allergic to meat and that might mean you want to become a vegetarian. But again, the reason it's in the section of dietary requirements is because typically it's a choice somebody makes and not something a doctor has told them they have to do. So vegetarian, don't eat animals. Some vegetarians will eat fish, but it just depends on the person. Now, vegan is someone that does not eat any animal products at all. So anything that has come from an animal. Eggs come from chickens. A vegan would not eat eggs. Milk comes from cows or goats. A vegan would not drink milk. And anything made with milk, cheese, yogurt, they would not eat those things either because, again, they come from an animal. So vegans have a much stricter diet than vegetarians. Nowadays it's very common to see people being vegan, to see menus having vegan options. You could say catering for vegans. And I personally really like vegan food. I've tried a lot of it and I, I enjoy it. I think it tastes good. Now on that note we have plant-based. Plant-based. The next few phrases I'm going to go through are mostly to do with marketing of products. So plant-based is just a marketing term for is vegetarian, is vegan, there is no meat in this product. But the reason we use the term plant-based is because it might say plant-based sausages. And typically sausages are made with pork. So they have to write plant-based sausages so that you don't mistake them for meat. But of course they could just write vegetarian or vegan sausages as well, but plant-based is a nice expression that some clever marketing person has come up with that sounds a bit more buyer-friendly than vegan sausages or vegetarian sausages. Anything that is plant-based just means it is created using plants, so vegetables, fruit, 
low sodium. You may see this on packaging or sometimes you see this on drinks, low sugar, low sodium. You may also see low calorie. So as the name suggests, all of these phrases suggest that there is low amounts of something in the product. So low sodium, sodium is salt. There are low amounts of salt in the product. Low sugar or zero sugar, as sometimes people like to, to put on the front of things, means a low amount of sugar. And of course, low calorie means a small amount of calories, a lower amount of calories. Now, technically, all of these are just marketing terms because you can swap all of these out for something else. For example, low sugar, it could have lots of fructose in it, which is a sugar, a natural sugar that comes from fruit. But I won't go into the lies and deception of marketing teams because that's not why we're here. We are here to learn English. So anytime you see low something, the idea is it's supposed to be healthier for you because there's not a large amount of those things in it. Now, the opposite of that is, of course, high protein, high protein. Now, often we see the phrases high protein in something that is not a meat product because typically we associate meat with protein. Oh, you want to start going to the gym? Eat more chicken. Or you want to gain weight? Eat more protein, eat more beef, eat more chicken. We always associate protein with animal products, meat. But of course, there's protein in a lot of different things. So the reason it might say high protein is because you might not associate that product with protein. For example, high protein yogurt. We do not associate yogurt with protein. We associate it with dairy. Milk, yogurts, ice cream, cheese, all of that is dairy. So a high protein yogurt is just emphasizing the fact that this product does have protein and you can eat it instead of meat or along with your meat. As I said, it's typically on products that we do not associate with protein. Now let's pretend we're in the egg section of our local supermarket. There's lots of different colors of eggs, lots of different pictures of happy hens, happy chicks. And you're looking at these eggs and trying to figure out which one you want. And you see these two phrases, organic and free range. Now you don't know what they mean. You don't know the difference, but the good news is I am here to help you. So typically, unfortunately, chickens are kept in cages. And I don't want this to turn into a animal protection video. So we'll just skip over that part really quickly. But typically chickens are not kept in the best conditions when they are producing eggs. So free range chickens means they are not in those cages. They produce eggs when they want to. They have grass to run around on. Now, of course, it depends on the farm because every farmer is going to be different and treat their animals differently. But in general, when you see that phrase free range, it means these animals have had space to grow and run and eat and produce eggs, produce milk. It's supposed to be better for the animals. So what does organic mean? Now, typically we associate organic with the very best of health food. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be careful of what you put in your body, you will always choose the organic option but it has a very broad meaning. Organic should mean that there are no chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers in the food or in the creation of that food, in the production of that food. So when the farmer's growing vegetables, they do not add harmful chemicals to make the vegetables grow faster or quicker, bigger. The chickens are not given meals that have chemicals in them to produce bigger eggs or they lay more eggs. Everything is done naturally. So people that follow an organic diet are trying to avoid chemicals. They don't want more chemicals in their body than there needs to be. So then we get into the really confusing 
parts here and this was quite confusing to read in the National Geographic article that I've shared so if you don't understand it don't worry because I had to read it three or four times before I understood what it meant so don't stress yourself out if you can't understand it these are non-GMO now GMO stands for genetically modified organism a genetically modified organism so the genes the genetics of something is like its dna how it is created its makeup why is a carrot a carrot because of its genes why is a broccoli a broccoli because of its genes why am i a person and not a dinosaur because of my genes so if you change the genes of something you are changing what you want it to become so you could change modify change and modify are the same thing you could change the genes of something to make it bigger tastier sweeter a genetically modified strawberry could be sweeter and more juicy than a naturally grown strawberry but the problem is you have no idea what's been put in that strawberry to make it bigger sweeter juicier you don't know what those chemicals are you don't know what you're putting in your body there's a lot of controversy about GMO, genetically modified organisms. Some people believe it's not a bad thing. Some people believe it is a bad thing. It just depends on your opinion. Some people avoid GMOs as much as possible. Some people don't mind them. And if something says on the front of it, a non-GMO product, it's just advertising the fact it has not been genetically modified. I don't really understand why you would need to put that on the front of a product because normal people don't expect their food to be genetically modified. But I guess it's another kind of marketing trend where they feel that they want to advertise. These are organic. These are GMO free. Similarly, bioengineered. Bioengineered is, as the name suggests, an engineered biological product. So there's a fantastic article that I will again share in the comments about the first bioengineered meat. And what happened was scientists in a lab took a piece of meat, a very, very small piece of meat, and duplicated it and duplicated it again. Duplicate means to double or copy. Better to say duplicate means copy. Copied the meat, copied the meat, copied the meat until they had 50 of these pieces of meat and they combined them to make a meatball and I'm doing this because it's not technically meat I don't know it depends on your opinion in my opinion I don't think I would eat something that came from a lab but at the same time I don't actually know where my food comes from I just have to believe what I'm told about where it comes from so I wonder what your opinion on this is. Would you eat bioengineered meat? Would you eat meat that came from a lab? So if that National Geographic article is a bit too confusing, go and have a look at the other one that I've left in the comments about the bioengineered meat. It's very interesting. And it's also written for non-native English speakers. So it will be easier to understand and it's a better layout. Now, finally, I have some vocabulary for you that is related to food and farming and agriculture in general, but not necessarily to what we eat. So the first one is nutritional. You will always see on the back of products nutritional information. Nutritional is the amount of nutrients, the amount of goodness you get from your food. So that will be how much sugar it has, how much protein. How much vitamin C, B, A it has in it. That is the nutritional value. How much nutrients you can get from this food. Processed. Processed. Now we talk about processes, which are the action of doing something, getting something finished, completed. And processed is similar because it's talking about how the food was created. But when we say processed food, it typically has a negative connotation a negative 
opinion attached to it because processed food is food that has been through lots of machines, lots of actions to make it edible. So think about McDonald's or any fast food chain. We would call this processed food because it is created for us. It's not actual pieces of meat put into the food, but it's meat that has been altered in some way put into the food. And we often consider this a, a negative thing because we don't know what they are doing to that meat. And we will probably never know because if we did, those businesses would go out of business because we would be upset by what is going into our food. We wouldn't use the term unprocessed, but just as a comparison, something that would be considered unprocessed would be where you know exactly where the food has come from. So a very popular meal in the UK is steak and chips. And steak is quite a high value meat. So typically, you know it has come from a farm where they have high value, good quality cows that eat good quality food. Now additives, pesticides and fertilizers. I talked about these a little bit earlier and these are my last three words for you. You probably won't use them much in your daily conversation or even your work conversation but if you are interested in politics or global issues or even current affairs you might talk about these a lot as they are directly related to global warming and climate change. So additives are chemicals we add to our food to make them different in some way, tastier, sweeter, have a better colour. There's a really good example of this. When I was uh, a child, I remember this, like it was a sweet, but it was also chocolate. They were called Smarties and there was a blue Smartie in the packet. And these Smarties, parents would complain because the blue one had such a high additive to make it that blue colour that children couldn't sleep, they were over overexcited, they had a lot of energy and parents were complaining that when their children ate this blue Smartie, they couldn't control them. So Smarties stopped doing the blue Smartie, re-looked at the recipe and found another additive that they could add that didn't have the same side effects, the same effects on children. And the Smartie was not as blue. I'll put a picture up here up here for you. It was not as blue because they changed the additives so they couldn't reach that blue colour. Pesticides. Pesticides. Now pesticides and fertilisers are very similar. They're used at the same stage of growth. They are used by farmers to encourage the growth of vegetables, fruits, but pesticides are to stop pests. That's where the word comes from. So a pest is anything you do not want on your farm, that you do not want eating your fruits and vegetables. So for example, small bugs, caterpillars, maybe small rodents like mice, those are pests. So pesticides stop those animals coming. And fertilizers, a fertile ground is a ground where lots of things can grow. There's lots of nutrients in that ground, in that soil. And of course, if you do not have nutrients in your ground, in your soil, you can add nutrients via fertilizers that give extra emphasis, extra boost to your vegetables, to your fruits, because they have this extra nutrients. Today was an interesting video because it's more something I'm interested in rather than something that's been requested from me. But these are the types of conversations I like to have with my students. I like to push you out of your comfort zone. Talk to you about things you've never talked about before. Because you never know when that information could be useful. You could go to a networking event. You could meet a new colleague. You could even start a new job that works with these kinds of chemicals or works with food and marketing in food or whatever the reason is. It's always important to push yourself out of your comfort zone. So if you have made it all the way through to the end of the video, I hope you've learned something. I hope there was something interesting there for you. If you don't feel you will ever use these words again, that is absolutely fine. But 
at least you have an idea now of what some of them mean. And maybe next time when you're walking through the supermarket, you might see some of these words and you'll think, I know what that means. I never noticed that word before, but I know what it means now. As always, thank you for supporting me. Thank you for being here. Let me know your thoughts down below. And I will see you next time. Have a fantastic week. Bye-bye.